Okay, guys. As I mentioned, what we're going to be doing now is we are going to be looking through some uh, archaeological digs, some finds, some things that kind of point back and give support to the Bible. Now, let me make sure you guys understand there is a difference in digging up something and saying, hey, this is a 100% a absolute Bible X versus this is supporting evidence for the Bible. Let me, let me show you what I mean by that. It'd be one thing if we dug up and we found, uh, <laughs> for instance, this is the tomb of Paul after his missionary journeys who was an apostle of Jesus Christ. And we dig up this tombstone and that we get all excited and say, wow, you know, that, that's one thing. But what if we found something like they found two years ago, like the Pool of Siloam? Pool of Siloam is not technically a Bible discovery, but why would it be important to me as a Christian? That's where John told that guy to go and wash, or something of the sort. Where Jesus told the blind person, right? Yeah. So, here you've got a, a biblical account that is further documented and supported by something we dig up. So, you know, over and over again, we, we, we run into these things, and that's kind of what I want us to look at for the remainder of our time. Um, let's start right here, and I'm going to have one of you guys, uh, what can I have you read? Actually, Dean, you can just you can just blather for a second. <laughs> there it goes. Oh wow! He's got practice. <laughs> because of that, that's I, enough. I, hey, Dean, that's that's all you needed to do right there. What you just did that was that was enough blathering. I hope the Titans lose. Oh no, you didn't. Yeah, I did. <laughs> okay. He doesn't take the red seats very well. <laughs> Uh, do you guys see anything on the screen? Okay, so y'all do see that. I'm, okay. I can see you on my bottom corner, but I'm seeing black, so. All right. Um, somebody tell me about a, we're, we're kind of going through this biblically. Somebody tell me a archaeological discovery that would support the flood. Not this one, but we're gonna see one tomorrow. Seashells on top of nowhere. <laughs> Somebody said we're gonna see one tomorrow. Yeah, I did say that. I'm sorry. Sorry, we've got a student coming tomorrow. He's making a presentation. That guy. Uh, what? Yeah. He's he's done some work around Mount Ararat or the region there. Yeah. And uh, yeah. He he's got some wood, and I think he's getting it tested or something. I don't know. We'll explain. We'll see it tomorrow. Okay. So, I would uh, approach that with care, is all I'll say. Yep, we are. Uh, how, about, how about the Epic of Gilgamesh? Anybody ever heard of that? Yes. Okay. Epic of Gilgamesh, it was actually found, if you look on the screen, stone tablets just like this one. You've got a flood story. Why is that a big deal? A lot of people would say, hey, that's, that's evidence against the flood. Guys, it makes sense to me if there really was a global flood that we're going to find flood stories in all kinds of ancient cultures. Now, are every single one of the details going to be right? No. Because we've all played the telephone game where you tell somebody sitting beside you something and you go around the room and by the time you get done, it doesn't resemble what the original person said. But the backbone of it is still there. How about this one? This was a, a site located a few miles north of ancient Babylon, uh, near the city of Nineveh. Excavation conducted in the early 1930s found a seal at the level of which predate 3000 B.C., which depicts a man, a woman, and a serpent, and a tree. Shows a tree in the center, a man on the right, a woman on the left, plucking fruit. Serpent behind her, standing erect. What's the point here? 
Garden. Garden of Eden. Ironic is it not that we've got a seal that pretty well depicts exactly what happened in the early books of Genesis. Uh, how about this one? Genesis chapter 4, verse 20. We've got people who ooh, who are already using metals. Speaks of Tubal Cain who forged all kinds of tools out of bronze and iron. Reference reflects the very early use of metal. It was formerly believed that the use of metal began very late, with the Iron Age near the in the Near East beginning at about 1200 B.C. Discoveries have shown, however, that metal was known and used much earlier than presupposed. For instance, a small steel axe from Ur on the late 3rd millennium B.C. was discovered. Uh, the Oriental Institute at the University of Chicago has uncovered evidence of an iron blade from a level dating about 2700 B.C. So do we have stuff that would fit a biblical record? Yes. Uh, let's go to, how about this one? Yeah. When we're talking about a date on that blade that's 2700 B.C., how are we arriving at that date? They are arriving at that date because of what all they found. So, for instance, um, if we got covered up and somebody comes along and they start discovering iPods in the dirt and they discover uh, MacBook Pro computers and things like that, can you kind of start making assumptions of what era that was? Yeah. Yes. Same thing with what they were doing. By the tools they were using, by the civilization that was there. I mean, let's be honest. We do know when certain civilizations were living on the earth. We, we can at least kind of identify, hey, when were the Mayans, the Aztecs, when were the Romans in power, that kind of thing. What tools were they using? What eating implements were they using? Uh, what was the way that they would kill people? How did they bury people? you got various cultural aspects that will allow you to know about a society. Um, I'm trying to think of a, a good one that would differentiate us from our grandparents. Um, this is a, a real... Yeah, well, televisions. If you're doing a fossil dig and you come across a color television, you know you're going to be somewhere you know, 1970s plus. If you find a flat screen television, you know that you're going to be somewhere around, mm, some probably somewhere around 2000 plus. Then if you go one step further and you find an LED television, you know you're going to be 2005 plus. So, you know, are there ways without actually physically dating stuff? Yes. All right, what about this one? Genesis chapter 12, verses 14 and 16. It came to pass, Abraham, or Abram, coming to Egypt, the Egyptian beheld the woman that she was very fair. The princess of Pharaoh saw her, praised her to Pharaoh. The woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. He dwelt, dealt with, with Abram for her sake. He had sheep and oxen. He asses, men servants, maid servants, she asses, and camels. And yet, a lot of skeptics say that camels here means that Moses couldn't have written the Pentateuch. Because according to them, they would say that it was only in 11th century B.C. that camels began to appear in inscriptions and ancient texts. But, having said that, let's look at what we do know. In Canaan. A camel jaw was found in the Middle Bronze Age tomb dating about 1900 to 1550 B.C. Northern Syria, a cylinder seal dating about 18th century B.C. was found which shows a number of deities sitting on a camel. In Egypt, there's a figurine of a kneeling camel loaded with two jars which was found in the tomb. Nineveh, the ancient capital of Syria, was found a bronze figurine of a man on a crouching camel which dates from the middle second, second millennium. In Greece, there was found two pots of Egyptian origin, both of which show camels 
and one showing human riders dating between 1800 and 1400 BC. So again, this doesn't directly support the Bible, but it supports the text of the Bible. I'm going to scoot way down. We may come back to some of this, but I'm going to scoot down to uh, some of the neat stuff. Ah, here we go. On the right side of the screen, you see a an inscription, obviously broken into pieces. Publication of fragments of an old Aramaic stella from Tel Dan in 1993-1995 revealed the first recognized non-biblical mention of a biblical king, David, in a text that reflected events of the year 841, likely would have been written soon after that date. The events described on the stone are also detailed in 2 Chronicles chapter 22. They include the killing of Ahaziza. I can't say that name. King of Judah and Jerom, king of Israel, by the general named Jehu. Surviving middle lines of the text, we have the killing or the defeating of someone, son of someone, king of Israel. And in the parallel, the killing of so-and-so relating to, says, the house of David. This phrase corresponds exactly to the Assyrian, which would say the house of Omri. In this way, a kingdom would be named after a prominent founder or dynasty. So here we find a clear mention of David as a dynastic founder of the kingdom of Judah around 150 years after his death. How about... This one, King Solomon also built ships at Ezion Geber, which is near Elath of Eden. We read of kings Hiram and Solomon organizing expeditions from the Gulf, this area known as Ezion Geber, down the Red Sea to Ophir, which, which returned with gold, wood, and gems. Where was this place? It's much debated. Its location is now with good reason, placed either at gold deposits behind the Red Sea Mountains of the Sudan or to the east across the Red Sea in Western Arabia. Over itself is no myth. A Hebrew ostracon of possibly the 8th century is clearly inscribed with a brief note of the account, Gold of Ophir, for Beth Horon, 30 shekels. Over here is the real source of gold, just as the gold of Amru or gold of Punt or gold of Cush, in the Egyptian text, gold in each case either derived from the land named or that land's type or quality. In other words, you've got a place that's specifically mentioned into the Bible talking about bringing back 420 talents of gold, and yet they found an inscription speaking very specifically of that. How about this one? Jezebel. Phoenician-style seal has been found which bears the name Jezebel and other Egyptian symbols, which is dated based on general style to the late 9th to early 8th century, may not have specifically belonged to the biblical Jezebel, but it does attest her name in a Phoenician context at the right time. Be remembered that not too many women of this time in the Levant had their own seals. So again, not necessarily pointing directly to, but at least giving strong credence of. Second Kings chapter 9 and 10 describe the anointing of General Jehu over king of Israel, his nearly simultaneous killing of the kings of Israel and Judah, and his destruction of the house of Ahab, of the house of Ahab, the prophets of Baal. Lo and behold, they found an inscription on a monument that reads, A tribute to Jehu, son of Omri, silver, gold, golden bowl, a golden breaker, golden goblets, pitchers of gold, tin, stays for the hand of the king, javelins received from him. First time on any archaeological artifact that a picture of an Israelite king was found. Dirt. Let's <laughs> Seal discovered in 1904 during excavations of Megiddo was engraved with a figure of a roaring lion and an inscription which read Shema on top 
and servant of Jeroboam on the bottom. The inscription proclaims the name and rank of its owner, one of the ministers of King Jeroboam II, who reigned from 787 to 747 B.C. The word servant is the Hebrew word ebed, and is mentioned in the Bible as one of the most highly high dignity in the government. This obviously coming from Jeroboam mentioned in 2 Kings chapter 13. Uh, let's see. Let me get to a couple of the other ones. As you can see, there's not really a, a lack of any of these, by the way. How about this? King Hezekiah, his encounter with the Assyrians. The invasion of Judah by the Assyrians is documented in what is known as the Taylor Prism, now at the University of Chicago. Prism describes a military campaign which moved westward, taking most of the Phoenicia, then moving towards the Philistines, taking the ancient cities of Joppa and Ekron. As the Assyrians approach Hezekiah, whoop, in Jerusalem, he could sense disaster and offered to pay a tribute to Sarachnareb. This encouraged the mighty Assyrian kings to send high dignitaries, along with a portion of his army, to Jerusalem to demand surrender. At the same time, Sennacherib sent the remainder of his force to Libna to do battle. Long story short, this is what we're finding specifically on this particular prism. And obviously, guys, you know this is a historical account straight from the text. Uh, let me... Let me break that for just a second. One of the articles that I want to make sure y'all read when, when you get your thing, Wayne Jackson did a, uh, can you see that? Yep. He did an article called A Glimpse into the Past where he did nothing but point out all of the different things that were categorized in the University of Chicago's museum. Um Anytime, Chicago's Oriental Institute, anytime you guys get a chance to go there, let me strongly encourage you to do so. Very, very powerful stuff up there. I'm going to read you a couple straight out of uh, something that I wrote, just to give you an idea of what we've got, and I may put some pictures up to back this up. But I do want to make sure we at least cover these. They are, I'm pretty sure they are in your book. <laughs> yeah, they are. Let's start with uh, the Pool of Siloam. December 23rd, 2004, archaeologists unearthed a pool that had biblical era coins with Jewish writing on them. Okay, somebody asked me, how do we date this stuff? Listen to what we're finding. Biblical era coins with Jewish writing on them. Upon further inspection, they realized they had uncovered the Pool of Siloam. Archaeological or archaeologists Eli Sukron declared, the moment that we revealed and discovered this four months ago, we were 100% sure that it was the Pool of Siloam. One of the excavators, Ronnie Reach of Haifa University, observed, we have excavated it, dated it very accurately with the coins found in the cement which the pool was built of. So how do you date this thing? You date it with the coins. You know when the coins were in circulation because of the rulers on the coins. We excavated it, dated it accurately. This is the same pool in which Jesus healed a man who had been blind from birth. John recorded that Jesus initially anointed the man's eyes with clay and then told him to go wash in the pool of Siloam. All right. How about this one? The Hittites. Genesis chapter 23. We find Abraham buying a cave in which to bury his beloved wife, Sarah, in fact, Abraham ends up buying the land from Ephron the Hittite. Now, you guys are in your second year of studies there at Bear Valley. You should have been very, very familiar with the word Hittite. You find it all throughout the Old Testament. We find it in Deuteronomy, Judges, 1 Kings, uh, 2 Chronicles. Obviously, there was a Hittite group of people. Bible references the Hittites approximately 40 times, and yet for many centuries there was no physical evidence of the Hittites. Skeptics claim the civilization never existed. However, in 1906, 
Archaeologist Hugo Winkler unearthed the Hittite capital in present-day uh, Bogoskoy, Turkey. All told, they discovered more than 10,000 cuneiform tablets in what is considered the ancient city's library. These tablets contain detailed laws, penalties for their society, and what are believed to have been in effect for 500 years. Centuries earlier, the Bible had recorded it. Now archaeologists finally verified it. So, again, you got the Bible speaking of Hittites. Skeptics saying, ah, we've never seen record of it. Lo and behold, 1906, this guy stumbles not just into proof of the Hittites. He finds what we would call their library. All of their laws, all their code. Uh, let me pull up another one. I'm going to show you a picture of it. The Moabite stone. Here we go. All right. Let me plug in. and This is a neat one. And again, guys, these are things that not only you need to be aware of, but these are things that you know, if you're looking for material to teach and preach on on a Wednesday night or a Sunday, um, Sunday night, can you guys see that? Yeah. Okay. Moabite stone discovered in 1868. To give it contrast, we learn in First Kings chapter 16, verse 23, that Omri became king over all of Israel. Second Kings chapter 3, verses 4 through 6. We learn that Misha was the king of Moab, that he rebelled against the king of Israel. August of 1868. Biblical account was confirmed on a piece of black basalt stone. F.A. Klein, a German missionary in Jerusalem, discovered the stone had been broken into many pieces. However, they had made a paper mache impression of this thing, of the entire thing. So they were actually able to go back and get all of the pieces of this thing. Put it back together. Uh, let's see. The stone describes how Moab fought against Omri, king of Israel. In addition, both the stone and 2 Kings chapter 3, verses 4 through 6, they both list Misha as king of Moab. It also records Misha's numerous victories over Omri's son, uh, over the Israelite tribe of Gad, and at Nebo and Jahaz. Consider also that this stone records the Hebrew name of Yahweh, further confirming God's word. So, you know, again, just basically trying to point out, we proved earlier the Bible's inspired, and lo and behold, now we're sitting here showing you, basically pulling up things that prove beyond the shadow of a doubt that, yes, this thing is inspired. Let me pull up another one real quick. Uh, Ah, thought I had it in here. Maybe I've got it. Hold on, I think I got it maybe in my PowerPoint. Ah, yeah, here we go. Elbow tablets. Okay, everybody see that? Discovered in northern Syria beginning in 1964. Ebla uh, was at the height of its power in 2300 B.C. with a population of 260,000 people, 11,000 civil servants. In 1973, Italian archaeologists discovered the ruins of the ancient city of Elba in northern Syria. Several years later, as excavators were digging through the, the ruins of the city palace, they came across more than 15,000 cuneiform tablets dated about 2200 B.C. These tablets contain what many believe is the earliest known reference to Jerusalem. While the majority of these tablets deal with commerce, there is also valuable information about the culture, the life of this ancient city, that many Bible scholars believe further validates some of the details, the names and places found in the patriarchal age. Additionally, some scholars recognize the name Canaan in these tablets. So, again, do we have... Information that would point to it, absolutely. Um, in the book, on page, 
bottom of page two, 124, I listed a, of all things, a brick. And the reason I started out with that one, guys, to me, this is pretty powerful evidence. And, you know, the irony of it is, of all, of all things, it's a brick. In Exodus chapter 5, verses 7 and 8, Moses wrote, You should no longer give the people straw to make bricks as before. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. British Museum, there is a brick discovered in Thebes, Egypt. As one might suspect, this brick does not draw the crowds as other exhibits draw. However, this brick contains a faint cartouche of great Ramses II. Provides strong evidence for Israelite history. The brick is composed of straw and mud from the Nile. It is dated about 1300 B.C. From the size of the brick, the imprint of the Ramses name, it is likely that this brick was used not in a common home, but rather in official royal construction. So, again, the point being, we got a Bible explanation of, of the Pharaoh saying, hey, we're not going to provide their straw anymore. We want them to keep building the same quota of bricks, but we're not going to give them straw. Lo and behold, we then find a brick that has got the cartouche of Ramses on it. It's got straw in the brick. Providing further evidence or further support that this thing is 100% accurate. Um, how about this one? And I know I've got this one, I think, on my other. Any questions or comments as I'm kind of going through all these? Is it getting harder and harder for uh, archaeologists to get into some countries to uh, excavate because of... Uh, I don't know, hostility towards Christians or, or who knows what reasoning, but, you know, like your Turkey and Jordan and stuff is probably pretty hard to get into. Yeah, in, in fact, I know of some missionaries that recently got kicked out, and uh, one of the helpers in that particular uh, expeditions was killed, uh, and I think it was around the Turkey area. It's It was not a, a pretty thing. They were basically just going over looking for different artifacts, obviously in that area you're wanting to look for anything all the way back to the, the flood, to the ark, and uh, it wasn't pretty. Other comments? Wow, Dean's quiet. Somebody, uh, somebody do some talking for me for just a second. Go ahead, Dean. <laughs> In Isaiah 44, we discover the prophet Isaiah naming. There Christ. we go. All right. Uh, you see what's on the screen? It is what we refer to a lot of times as the Pilate inscription. The Bible records the name Pontius Pilate in a variety of instances in the New Testament. Skeptics question whether Pilate was a real person, a question which would obviously bring doubt upon the crucifixion of Jesus. 1961, so this isn't that long ago. 1961, a limestone block was discovered that put an end to the skeptics' charges. Deemed the pilot stone, it is a brick discovered in an excavation of an ancient theater. The theater that was built by the decree of Herod the Great in about 30 B.C. The inscription on the stone reads, The prefect of Judea, Pontius Pilate, erected the Tiberium, or the temple in honor of Tiberius Caesar to the Augustus gods. Single discovery not only demonstrates that Pilate indeed was a real person, but it also records his full name and his position. Well, these are just, uh, you know, basically when you look at, you got Matthew 27, verses 1 and 2. Obviously, we know text over and over, the Gospels talks about Pontius Pilate or Pilate. Now we've got a stone that they discover in this theater that backs that up. Let me show you a coin example. Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, during the time of King Herod, Herod the great well-known pro-Roman ruler of Judea who lived from 73 to 4 B.C. Somebody tell me who replaced him. There you go. We talked about that 
recently. Here it is, was replaced him. His accomplishments included the construction of an ancient city, the harbor of Caesarea, second temple of Jerusalem. He is also known as a tyrant who had some of his own wives and children executed. Roman Emperor Augustus is known to have joked at the time that it was preferable to be Herod's pig than his son, a very uh, insulting remark to the Jews. What's the big deal? Lo and behold, we have coins. And inscriptions, obviously, that point out the fact that this guy was real. Uh, I'm not going to go through all this just because of time. But I think you guys get the picture. Let me look for one more. We want to look for Cyrus the Great Cylinder. Ah, I don't have it on there. Sorry, guys. Let me see if I got it in the book. <coughs> yeah, well, I don't have a picture, though. Page uh, 129. Isaiah 44, we discover the prophet Isaiah named Cyrus as a future anointed king of Medo-Persian -Persia, uh, Empire. Prophecy occurred approximately 150 years before Cyrus was born. Yet we know Isaiah's prophecy was confirmed, recorded in 2 Chronicles chapter 36 and in Ezra chapter 1. Cyrus would be the leader who would defeat the Babylonians and eventually allow the Jews to return and rebuild their homeland. So obviously Cyrus was a pretty important person. In 1879, uh, Rassam found what has become known as the Cyrus the Great Cylinder, also called the First Bill of Human Rights. Baked clay cylinder describes Cyrus's conquer or conquest of Babylon in 539 B.C. As a result of his conquest, Cyrus gave permission for the exiled Jews in Babylon to return to Jerusalem. The cylinder records, quote, I, talking about Cyrus, gathered all of their inhabitants, returned them, returned to them their inhabit uh, and their inhabitations. So, again, the point being. Time and time again, you've got all of these things that have been uncovered. Do we ever hear about any of this kind of stuff from the mainstream media? Nope. Never. No. Nope. I mean, I, I didn't, obviously, you guys have got the book in front of you. You'll notice I didn't, I put in several good examples, but I didn't load it up like I could have. Uh, the document that I've been working off of, showing you guys the Word document. It's 130 pages long. And basically it goes, starts in Genesis chapter 1, and it goes through and it's showing any and everything that would point to archaeology and the Bible, starting in all the way back in the book of Genesis. So you figure, 130 Word pages. That's a lot of information. That's a lot of discoveries that we have that, that can back this thing up. Um, questions, comments? Is that document on a site where we can look at it? I could probably get it there. What about crucifixion? What do we know about crucifixion? Do we have any archaeological evidence that would point out that, number one, the crucifixion was real? And number two, that what we talk about with Jesus Christ, that that would actually be real. Oh, come on, guys. Spikes. The spikes that were used. Okay. Have we found in an ossuary, for instance, <laughs> a set of feet bones that actually have a spike going through it? The answer is yes. Um, let me back, let me grab this. Let me see what year it was. 1968. Zafaris 
discovered a large spike traversing through the right heel bone of a crucified victim. It bore a Hebrew inscription, Johanahan, the son of somebody, contained a seven-inch spike piercing the remains of two heel bones. It also had a piece of olive wood at the point of it. Archaeological data revealed that the spikes used at the time of Christ's crucifixion were tapered iron spikes five to seven inches long with a square shaft roughly three-eighths of an inch across. So not only do we have ossuary findings of a spike, we've got wood at the end of it, further verifying the fact that this was a means of death back then. How do we know that the Romans crucified people? Other than the Bible telling us so? Other than the Bible. Well, we have um, secular history tells us that, or maybe it's religious history, but it's not the Bible tells us that Peter was crucified. I mean, that's not, that's extra Bible, biblical resource there. Okay. What did, uh, was it Alexander the Great, what did he, uh, or Herod, what did they light their gardens with? Christians. It was Nero. Christians. Nero. Nero, I'm sorry. Do we have examples of Romans, of Greeks, putting Christians on stakes, putting them on crosses? The answer is absolutely. Uh, one of the studies that I did back about five years ago was I spent a, about three or four months doing nothing but studying crucifixion, the art of crucifixion, so to speak. Didn't start with the Romans. The Romans perfected it. But we got loads and loads of good archaeological evidence that, yes, this was a method of killing. And it was usually reserved for the worst of the worst. So, you know, Time and time again, I guess what I'm trying to get across to you, make sure that you understand is, it's one thing for you to look your daughter or your, your son in the eye and say, hey, the Bible is inspired. And then go, yes, daddy, okay, daddy. It's something else for you to say that and then back it up with physical evidence that they can look at and go, wow, okay, yeah, I get it, and I really do get it now. I see it. Because that, to them, suddenly this whole thing becomes alive, it becomes real. They realize that maybe I physically haven't been there, I can't walk there, but there's a place on this planet where I can go and I can visit a rock that talks about Pilate. I can see a brick that's talking about Ramses. I can go and I can see a spike just like Jesus Christ had going through it. All of this evidence... As you're mounting it up, guys, you really honestly have to try hard to ignore all of it. Dean. Oh, I don't have a question. <laughs> Just a head scrap. Yeah. Comments, questions. Okay, let's let's talk about this for just a moment. Why do you think this information is not getting out? Have an agenda. It doesn't fit the agenda. Okay. I think it's because some people just aren't studying. I agree. Totally agree. It really frustrates me when uh, you know the Hollywood elites come out and they produce a movie that is just so anti-Bible, anti-religion, anti-whatever. And it's obvious the producers of that movie have done no homework whatsoever on Bible history. You know, it's basically like, I'll give you the, the best for instance. James Cameron says, hey, we found an ossuary with the name Jesus on it. That sounds like he's got the goods on Jesus Christ. Until you find out that Jesus was the sixth most common name back then. It would kind of be like finding a gravestone today with the word Steve or Joe on it. Can you walk through a cemetery and find a tombstone that says Steve or Joe? Absolutely. 
So, you know, they don't, they aren't doing their homework. Somebody else had a comment. Well, yeah. <clears throat> I think it also has a lot to do with uh, pluralism because if this stuff gets out and it's proven that the Bible matches up with history and archaeology, then one has to see, okay, well, does the Quran add up with history and archaeology? Does the Book of Mormon add up with history and archaeology? And once that hap- once it doesn't fit, then there's only one, only one common right. denominator. And there's only one way. John? We can see that the information is out there for us as Christians, mm-hmm. um, but we're not doing our homework to get it out to the to the congregation either. I mean That's true. It doesn't I can see right now it doesn't take a whole lot to do a little investigative work to find this information because it's already been it's already out there for us. But we're not getting Absolutely. it out to the uh, congregations. And um, that's where you know we cannot rely on, on Hollywood and such to do their to do that for us. Well, we do unfortunately um, in some areas, but uh, that's not uh, <laughs> that's our that's our responsibility as parents as leaders uh, to to get that out to, as preachers. So. Absolutely, you know it, it frustrates me. <clears throat> Any teenage class that comes through the church that has not been exposed to what we're doing right now, to me, we have failed them because. They need to have the evidence for why they believe what they believe. We don't need to just throw them in a class on dating or throw them in a class on peer pressure or whatever. (laughs) These are kids that need to have evidence for why they believe what they believe. Because, guys, let's face it. Let's be real totally blunt with ourselves. If they don't. 100% 100% firmly grasp that the Bible truly is inspired of God. It doesn't matter what it says about dating or not dating, or what it says about purity, or what it says about any of these peer pressure, whatever. Because ultimately, if they don't believe it, they're not going to follow it. So until they have a 100% stake in the book, we've wasted our time. Because, yes, they may sit in a Bible class and they may give us the right answers and they may say, oh, yes, I'm supposed to to remain pure and I'm supposed to not smoke dope and I'm not supposed to drink alcohol and I'm supposed to be blah, 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 blah. But unless they understand, hey, there's, there's something to this book, it's God's book, and because it's God's book, there's going to be serious judgment to pay until they really grasp that, all this other stuff that we're teaching them, that's peripheral. Yep. Uh, another thing, I don't know if you've recognized it or maybe I'm just guessing, but within the church, I'm assuming that there's some leadership that uh, within the body of Christ that does not believe in a literal um, young earth or a literal six day creation. And yeah. without that foundation of understanding, I think that's uh, harming the, uh, the church of the future. Um, now, I don't know if you've seen that in your travels or not. <laughs> uh, oh, that. just only about every weekend. But I wonder if we would survey or question uh, across the country, across the world, leadership in the Lord's Church, if what they believed in as far as if, um, back to Genesis, what they believe in the Genesis you know, 1, the account, if what they believe, if it's yep. uh, true or not. Uh, I think we might be surprised as to what we, we find out. And, John, here's here's how I hear it often. I hear people say things like, well, you know, it, all this stuff you're talking about is, is good, but, you know, to me it doesn't matter. I believe in God, and he could have done it any way he wanted to. Translation, I don't buy the way he said he did it. Right. You know, he could have done it any way. Absolutely he could, but he told us how he did do it. And and if you, again, you know, I know you guys have heard this countless times, but if you throw out the first 11 chapters of the book and you say, well, those are just nice, neat stories, well, what am I supposed to believe about the divided kingdom? Is that a nice, neat story? 
What am I supposed to believe about all of these different kings that suddenly we start finding in inscriptions? Are they just stories? What about this brick that we find that matches up beautifully with Exodus? Is that just a story? Other comments? Yep. I just think a lot of people don't want to, it's such a bone of contention, they don't want to talk about evolution, they just don't want to stir the waters, they don't want to talk about six days, you know, they, some people don't like confrontation, and you're definitely not confrontation over, you know, six days of creation, That's number one. Number two is, you're just inundated with that bad information. You're inundated with it, your kids are inundated in it, it's all over the television set, Absolutely. So, you know, you don't know how to refute it unless you have something like this. Absolutely. This is the only way because, they, you know, they, they, they inundate you with that mess. I mean, it, it's it's uh, poison, but after a while you say, mm, that poison tastes pretty good. That's all I got, you know. Yep. Like, until, yep. until you can get something to fight, to fight uh, on, on, I guess, on, on common territory. A lot of people don't like to fight, even in church. They, and that's why I said, well, I don't care how God did it, as long as we all, because we all love God, but, you know. But God should we say, not fight for the truth? We have to fight for it. Not because ultimately, guys, here, here, here's where we are. If we don't fight for the truth, that means we're willing to compromise. Absolutely. And if you are willing to compromise the events of creation, who's to say I can't compromise baptism? Amen. Or I can't compromise one New Testament church. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? And, and here's what blows my mind is parents don't see that. Parents don't realize if they view Adam and Eve as, as just a myth, why are the parents surprised when their kids are basically viewing baptism as just kind of something? Yeah. Yes, Mr. Dean. So... <clears throat> I take it you would regard uh, how someone views uh, Genesis 1-1 as a salvation issue? Uh, I view all of the Bible as a salvation issue. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really. Uh, you know, in all seriousness, the Bible is God's Word. So, it, it, to me, if you're willing to compromise any of it, it it's funny when people ask me that, I'll say, hey, do you view the book of Malachi as a salvation issue? And they kind of look at you like, you know, what are you talking about? <laughs> but, the, but the point is the same, and that is, are you saying we can chop out this part and all the rest of it will be okay? Because if you say that, then that means basically we can start kind of picking our poison and deciding who, what, what we're going to cut, why we're going to cut it, etc. And, guys, that just ain't working for me. And it better not be working for you since you're going to be teachers of the truth. Oh, no. I mean, I agree with you, Brad. I was just seeing... Oh, I know. I know. <laughs> John? Let me yeah. Ask your opinion. Let me ask your opinion on this. Uh, sitting here thinking about this. and um, As we go out, as after we graduate from here, and we go to apply for preaching positions, and we sit there in that interview with elders or leadership, what have you. I'm going to say elders here. but uh, Right. And, uh, and I've had at the back of my mind that, you know, if I'm in that position, uh, I, I know I'm going to have some questions for them, too, and we all, I think we all should. Absolutely. Do you think that that's one question, well, yeah, as far as uh, how they interpret creation, how what they believe in creation as an eldership, should that be asked? If they do, if they have a nonchalant or uh, an understanding that they really don't care, it's not about that. It's about just the Bible and such. Should we submit ourselves under an eldership like that? Because would it be a no-win situation, do you think? Of course, that kind of depends on the situ uh, you know, each individual situation. But, I mean, if you've got an eldership that really doesn't have, hasn't thought about it or care about it, uh, is that putting ourselves in a dangerous position? It probably is. Let me let me share with you what I would I would I personally would probably recommend you do, and that is study with them. Um, just say hey, um, 
here's where I am. Where are you? And if they come back and say, well, you know, it really doesn't matter. Just ask them nicely, hey, you know, if, if things move forward and we all feel like this is a good fit, would you men mind if, if we study together on this? Because, you know, I'm approaching this from a, a biblical worldview and, and here's some things that, that I hold dearly and I, I believe are truths and I would like to, to study with you guys. I, I'm, John, I'm, I'm unique in that I don't think necessarily that would be a deal breaker. Right. But I think you would be very, very cautious. Because it can understand, I'm coming at this thing from the material we are covering together is not just material. It is a whole way of looking at the world. It's not just a matter of looking at some archaeological data. It's a matter of looking at that data, realizing that supports the Bible, and the Bible can't be that old because I've got this genealogy. If I've got a timeline, according to the Bible, and I've got pieces of rock that fit into this timeline, I've got to live my life according to that, that that is history. And if they're willing to say, mm, you know what, I'm going to buy a little bits and pieces of it, but I don't buy the whole thing then we got some pretty big problems. So, I, you know, I guess first thing I would do is say, hey, can we sit down and study this? Right. I mean, obviously, if, they, if they're not willing to study, if they're men, elders who say, you know, we, we, we know what we need to know, we're done here. But if they are willing to study, then hey. If they're willing to study, it tells you two things. Number one, you may be able to teach them the truth. If you've got good, humble men who don't feel like they know everything, right. which is a good thing. Yes, sir? I still think you could probably try harder than that, though, uh, Brad, and go ahead and take the job, uh, establish relationships, get close with the elders, and, and upon those relationships being built and being firm, you might have a better chance of being able to study with them after that. Uh, but I would feel like one of the last things you want to do is just put your hands up in the air and say, I'm not, I'm not even going to try with this church. Well, that could be 150 people with children and grandchildren who all don't believe in creation but evolution or the Don Kai or whatever, you know. So I, I would think you want to try a little bit harder, you know. Absolutely. Well, yeah. But, again, be very careful because, because would you want to get pull yourself into a situation like that if it was a congregation that said, well, maybe baptism is not essential. Or a congregation that said, well, you know, we kind of got a, a loose feeling on musical instruments. Do you want to be the guy that has to fix all of this stuff? Knowing that there may be some personalities there that aren't going to allow you to fix it. In a, in a perfect world, I know exactly what you're saying and I agree. We, we should be teaching. But unfortunately, we don't live in a perfect world. And there are going to be congregations where you have men who have very strong attitudes and personalities, and it may be that m my mama's line has always believed this, and we're going to keep on believing this, and oh, by the way, we founded this church, and if you come in here teaching something else, you might as well pack your bags. Yeah. And, you know, there, you hate to say that, but are there congregations like that where certain families are, quote, pillars of the congregation? Yeah, that's the truth there. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, let's start right here. Actually, yeah, let's start right here. You guys see something on the screen? Yeah. Okay, Michael Roos. Michael Roos wrote a book called Can a Darwinian Be a Christian? Look very carefully at what he says. Can a Darwinian be a Christian? Absolutely. Is it always easy for a Darwinian to be a Christian? No, but whoever said that worthwhile things in life are easy? He said, is the Darwinian ob obligated to be a Christian? No, but try to be understanding of those who are. He goes on to say, there are plenty of resources open to the Christian who would move towards science and away from a literal reading of the early book of Genesis. 
You see any problem with that? Uh, yeah. Just a few. So, basically now to kind of land the plane that we've just been talking about. What does it matter if it was six days or six million years? What does it matter if God created man directly or if we evolved? What does it matter if God created everything or he used a Big Bang explosion? Ultimately, it matters because the foundations of the creation account are being compromised. And if there was no creator, guys, then there's no savior. How do I say that, Dean? Why would I say that? Because if God didn't create the world, then obviously he couldn't bring about Jesus into something he didn't create. Why did Jesus have to come? Because of sin. Redemption. Guys, if you take out the fall of man in Genesis chapter 3, you've eradicated the entire redemption scheme throughout the Bible. That's why what we're talking about is very, very serious. And then you asked me if I thought it was a salvation issue, and, you know, that's, that's where we're at right here. If you, if you take out this stuff, then you're basically rewriting the whole redemption scheme of the Bible. Because here are the two, two options. You got the Bible that says in Genesis 3, man fell. The rest of the Bible telling us how to try to get back into it. You got evolution telling you that Genesis is a myth and that in the beginning there was nothing but dirt. Two totally different approaches. Okay, so think about where we are. We proved God. We proved the Bible. We proved Jesus. We've looked at a handful of archaeological evidence that supports the Bible. And we, we even pointed out a few little funny things that disprove evolution. The next obvious question is this. What about man? How does man fit into this whole thing? Are we made in the image and likeness of God? Or are we simply the products of some cosmic explosion? All of you guys have seen images like the one on the screen. That's not anything new. My question to you as we start this thing would be, okay, how much of that evidence really does exist? And how much of it is simply an artist interpretation? 100%. Over the next, or, you know, over the next time together, what we're going to be talking about is fossil man. Made in the image and likeness of God, or did we evolve? Actually, I had an aunt who told me one time, she said, you know, Brad, it doesn't matter to me whether it's six days or six billion years, or, or whether we evolved from some ape like Greek Neanderthal man or whatever. And I'm thinking, okay, I know I have a soul, and she would say she has a soul. So at what point did God allegedly come down and instill a soul in this evolving creature. Did he look at Neanderthal man and say, oh, okay, now we've finally gotten far enough, now I'm going to give it a soul. <laughs> because I think everybody in there would agree we have a soul. Yep. All right, here we go. Time for test. Uh-oh. You ready? Sure. You see the picture on the screen? Don't say it out loud, Dean. <laughs> I want you to look at what that is and tell me what is missing. What what did that used to be? Now, I suspect at least one or two of you probably are thinking maybe that was a figure eight. Anybody there take a figure eight? Anybody think it was a circle? Or a donut, I mean? 
circle. I mean, I thought it was a circle. Pretty much most of you, okay. So what was missing? Why did you think something was missing? Because <laughs> you're making assumptions. Yeah. Guys, missing link implies that something is missing. If there are no missing links, could it be because they never really existed in the first place? You see how your mind was set up to believe that something should be there. The same thing happens with this whole evolutionary tree of man. They basically set your mind up to fill in that circle. And so we've got to basically first stop and ask ourselves, was it even a circle to begin with? Or could it be that we find a bone of something and that was never a missing link? Was that chapter 4? And I think I... That's actually verse 6. It says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. John chapter 3, verse 12, If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? What's the point here? If we can't believe the Bible based off of creation... And how can we believe the Bible in regards to our salvation? Okay. And if he has told you about heaven, and you have a big enough problem looking at life here on the earth and looking at human and mankind, and you can't figure out mankind, how in the world are you ever going to believe? If you can't believe humans, which you can see came from God, how are you ever going to believe anything about heaven? 1 Peter 3.15, Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Be ready always to give an answer to everyone that asks you a reason, the, the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So here's their story. Allegedly, millions of years ago, we branched off, we evolved upright stance, and lo and behold, now we're walking around Christmas shopping and buying our wives gifts. <laughs> Let me point out an obvious thing that, that everybody in there needs to know of and be very aware of. I'm always asked the question on the <coughs> excuse me, on the weekends, Brad, if, if they say we came from apes, then why do we still have apes? Sounds like a good question. But an evolutionist immediate response is going to be, we didn't come from apes. We evolved from ape-like creatures. The apes took one branch, we took the other. Lo and behold, we apparently got the lucky branch. So if you look on the screen, you notice you've got... Uh, Ape over here going off by himself. You got this primate common ancestor trunk down here at the bottom. So what's the problem with all this? Well, here's the evolutionist timeline. They would say three to five million years ago is when man finally evolved an upright stance. They would say written records only came into being roughly 5,000 years ago. And yet, according to what we've looked at this class period, the earth isn't that old. And furthermore, it would teach that man and monkeys were created in the same week. So then what, what would we say is the real battle? Real battle, you got one that says Adam is in your past, that absolutes come from God, that God sets the rules, or ape is in your past. You got relative morality and that man sets the rules. Do you see a difference there? Yep. Yeah. Let me, I'm going to unplug my uh, PowerPoint. 
tell me why the uh, the origin of man is such a big deal. It all comes it all comes back to uh, the you know God is real or not uh, the existence of God. Um, they could break that down for whoever they want to. I mean, they, their objective is to uh, just get rid of God altogether, and that's just another area where they're trying. Okay. Dean? <clears throat> well, if um, we did evolve from apes or ape-like creatures, then it ultimately, that right there says that there is no God because then it becomes a figment of one's imagination and that there are no standards, there are no rules, and you can have homosexual marriage, you can have uh, people marrying kids, you can have people saying it's their right uh, to do whatever they want, basically. Okay. What else? It's a big deal because God said it very plainly in Genesis how the origins of man. So if evolution is being taught in textbooks and on... CNN and everyone's getting so overwhelmed by that trash, then everyone's sort of being programmed to adopt something that's completely unbiblical. Yeah. Um, also in Genesis chapter 2, we have God bringing all of the animals to, to Adam, to man, um, giving man dominion over, over all of the animals. So God is clearly setting man apart. Absolutely. Which, by the way, I, I, I point this out now because we may not talk about it when we, we talk about man specifically. Guys, do not lose sight of the fact that a lot of this environmental mess and some of this uh, animal protection mess is very anti-Bible. Um God was very clear that we humans are to have dominion over his creation and that animals are below us. Now, I don't think we should abuse. I don't think we should, you know, do anything to, to harm God's creation. But we do need to realize that we're on two totally different planes. Man was created with a soul. Animals are here for our purpose. So when, when people, you know, do all these massive protests and talking about Saving the whales and saving the, the spotted owl. You know what? Maybe we ought to think about saving the unborn children. Amen. Because they have a soul. That owl was just put here for us. So, you know, keep keep it all in perspective. Um, we're going to deal with the origin of man on the Tuesday when we come back. Let me throw out, go ahead and, and be reading while you're away. Pages 180 to 204. We're going to talk about how do we get all the different races? How do we get four different blood types from just two people? You ever thought about that? Uh we're going to talk about Neanderthal man and some of these alleged missing links. But I'll go ahead and basically give you the, the easy cliff note version, and that is God created apes, God created man. Are there variations of apes? Absolutely. Are there variations of man? I'm looking at some right now. I'm seeing pretty heads and ugly heads and fat heads and you name it. That doesn't mean that you guys have evolved. It simply means you got variations. You know, I always try to, to point out the fact that even with just within the human race, we got a lot of diseases that will change bone structure. A lot of different genetic variabilities that, you know, osteoporosis, arthritis, etc., that can change your skeletal structure. Doesn't mean that that fossil was a product of evolution. Any comments? Dean? Um, Brad, what was your uh, I just website again? Uh, in order to get there, you mean? Yeah, to get your idea. Let me show you guys. Actually, I can walk you there, too, by the way. If 
you go to there we go if you go to uh, HTTP uh, the HTTP type in get up here at the top me.com no I'm sorry public dot me dot com backslash Brad here did I see the address up there at the top our resolution isn't that great Brad okay HTTP colon backslash backslash public dot me dot com slash Brad here of all one word if you go there, here's where it's going to take you, just so you can guys can see. I know some of you may not have been there. Um, it takes you to my public idea, iDisk file. And these are files in there. You'll notice the second folder says Bear Valley to Students. If you click on that, you'll notice there are four PowerPoint presentations and our syllabus is right there you guys all you got to do is then hit the download button and boom you've got what you need same thing with the PowerPoint you hit download boom you got what you need so I put I loaded up the Messianic Prophecy Inspirational Bible Existence of God and Deity of Christ any other comments questions before I let you guys go No, he's not gone. <laughs> Just to follow up your comment about animals, there's a, a congregation here in Lakewood, a you know, one-size-fits-all kind of place, uh, that let this past October announced their new animal ministry where they have counseling, grief counseling services for your pets. Very uh, nice. All, all, kinds, all kinds of therapies for your pets. I forget what the, the exact acronym is, but the the name for this ministry is I Am, and it's, I forget what the I is, but the A-M is Animal Ministry. But anyway. How about idiotic? Yeah. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's amazing uh, uh, what they're doing here. They have all kinds of counseling, that, uh, even as far as if you have company coming and there's a visiting pet in the house, how to, oh my uh, so how to counsel your pet. Oh. Oh, wow. This was actually written up in the Denver paper back in August. <laughs> wow. You need to rip them out the pews, throw them out, and say, go knock a door. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, I do hope you will have a wonderful holiday. Everybody, please travel safely. Enjoy your time. Don't get behind. I don't want you to, to spend all of your time uh, over the holidays studying Christian evidences because you need to spend time with your family and to – Enjoy some, some time away, but I also don't want you to just to completely shut your brain down. Uh, when we come back, we're going to hit it hard and heavy. And like I say, you'll have about a week before we take a midterm. If you have any questions, comments between now and then, let me know. I think everybody pretty much now has turned in a, uh, a topic for the paper. That's great. If you get, you know, if you get a few hours over the holiday, if the football game has rained out, y'all can do a little research. And uh, other than that, enjoy it, guys. Thanks, Brad. Thanks, Brad. Enjoyed it. Appreciate